Welcome to Encounter Wargaming, I'm Jay, and today we're going to take another look at a second edition of Warhammer 40,000 with my sweet collection of books here with the Codex Ultramarine. So Codex Ultramarines. Now we're starting our look into the codices of second edition and we've gone through all the basic core sets and stuff like that. I want to focus now on all of the codices. I'm pretty sure I have all of them in my possession. Um, if I don't, hopefully you guys can tell me if I'm missing anything as these videos progress. But I wanted to start with Ultramarines because pretty much any time Games Workshop comes out with a new edition, the very first army to get a redo is the Space Marines. In fact, in some editions they've even redone the Space Marines halfway through the edition and then redo them again when the new edition comes out because of course the Space Marines are the poster child of Games Workshop and rightfully so. Uh, so in second edition you, if you weren't playing Blood Angels or Space Wolves or any of those specialty chapters uh, you went with Codex Ultramarines. Now obviously Ultramarines are a specific chapter but in this case these are your generic Space Marines because pretty much every chapter that is at least Codex compliant um, will operate under these means. Now, like I say, they did come out with a Codex Space Wolves, they did come out with a Angels of Death book, which actually outli outlined the Blood Angels and Dark Angels factions. Uh, there was no special rules for Black Templars or anything like that, um, or Iron Hands or Salamanders or any of the stuff that we have nowadays, you just used the Ultramarine book. So, without further ado, let's take a look at Codex Ultramarines. First thing we always do, oh actually, first thing I want to comment on is how thick the codices are. Now, nowadays we're seeing thick codices again, but you'll see when we finally get to the uh, third edition stuff how skinny the books actually got. And uh, we'll go over the reasons for that when it happens, but for right now, we're going to crack this baby open and take a look at the most important page I always look at. Actually, let's take a look at some of the uh, miniatures first, because I always love looking back at the silliness that is the old school models. So look at these Tyranids. There's the old Screamer Killer and the Gene Stealers. I still love the old Gene Stealer models, the old plastics, and the old Ultramarines. Look at these really old Grots, eh? Those are the old Pewter Grots. Plastic ones that came in the starter set were those static ones with the auto gun, and then we had these pewter ones, but anyway, I've gone off on a tangent enough. This is a big book and we need to get through it. So, first thing I always look at is of course the year, 1995. Perfect. Um, so this came out the year before I actually started playing the game, which is awesome. Um, our writers, we've got Rick Priestley, Jervis Johnson, and Alan Merritt. Table of Contents. Sweetness. So, we're going through, of course, all of the fluff for the first half, explaining all the different units and, you know, sort of their fluff, their rules, stuff like that. And then we get into the actual army list, where it tells you how you can compose your force, how all the weapons work. So here, even though we went through Codex War Gear, that was kind of um, a general way to get everybody started. So like I say, Second Dead was really a giant jump from Rogue Trader. It was a complete rehaul of the rules, and so they released rules for every faction. Um, then when they started to release the individual, individual codices, they started to change things here or there. Um, and of course they included all of the rules here, so you didn't have to refer back to that uh, reference. Um, so that all you needed to play was your codex and all of your data faxes and cards and things like that that you needed to go along with it. So we've got a whole bunch of fluff at the beginning. Marnius Kelgar. That is a wicked cool picture. I'm loving it. Space Marines. General fluff that we're used to, showing the 20 legions that were originally founded. And of course, the 2nd and the 11th are unknown. All records destroyed following the Horus Heresy. Now, of course, over the years, they have evolved the Horus Heresy storyline back in this um, era. This was pretty much all we knew about the Horus Heresy. It was like these couple of paragraphs here. Outlining the Great Crusade, 
all the first founding legions, the Horus Heresy and how it worked. These are all the legions that fell to chaos. So of course the nine we're used to: Emperor's Children, Iron Warriors, Night Lords, World Leaders, Death Guard, Thousand Sons, Black Legion, Word Bearers, and Alpha Legion. Again, commenting on how the second and the eleventh. Uh, I've been erased, and that the history of the Dark Angels during the Heresy is unknown, which is interesting, because of their whole fallen secrecy stuff. Alright, the defeat of Horus, we're getting into the High Lords and how they run the Imperium and all that stuff. And then of course the Codex, Codex Astartes, so these are your Codex Loyal Legions. The Space Wolves, Ultramarines, Dark Angels, Imperial Fist, Blood Angels, White Scars, Iron Hands, Salamanders, and Raven Guard. Again, listing also their successors. Now, of course, they've added a lot to this list again um, in the last 20 years or so. Yeah, damn, I guess it has been 23 years since this book came out. Holy crap. And, uh, yeah, as you can see, as usual, the Ultramarines have an extensive list of successors. And strangely enough, on this list, the Dark Angels have more successors than the others. With the exception of the Ultramarines, of course, because they were the most... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Most stable gene seed, and so they had the most successors. As is still the fluff. Got a little paragraph there about the Dark Founding. Something we can get into in later videos, maybe. And the Grey Knights, even, they've talked about here. That very That's interesting, because back then there was only rules for Grey Knight Terminators. They didn't have an extensive army list until 3.5, when they came out with the Demon Hunters book, which, again, we will look at in future videos. We've got the history of the Ultramarines going into the history of their Primarch, which is spectacular. And I love this John Blanche artwork. Like, look at that stuff. It's just so grimdark. The Emperor discovering McCraig, the Fortress of McCraig, after the Heresy, the Second Founding. Again, giving us a little more about the Cursed Founding. Interesting. I'm not going to go through all this fluff in detail, obviously, guys. Like I say, this is a large book, and uh, I'm just kind of showing you what it looks like. Comment below this video, and I'll maybe consider doing some fluff videos, but there's plenty of that stuff on YouTube already. I really want to show you guys these relics, these books, and what they looked like back then compared to nowadays. And let's, you know, just take a trip down memory lane together. A little blast from the past, a little nostalgia. I love my nostalgia. The military of Ultramar. Right? Enforcing the fact that the Ultramines have a large section of the galaxy. They don't just focus on their home world, they recruit from all around. Uh, the Ultima Segmentum, I think. You may correct me on that, but I think that's the reason it's called the Ultima Segmentum, because Ultramar is basically in the heart of it, which is the Ultramarines' little mini-empire that they've created for themselves. Of course, being part of the Imperium, but they, of course, police it. And then we're getting into the color pages. Oh, we got some cool Chaplin artwork there. That's spectacular looking. Here we go, we got some different chapters that you can play around with that you would use this book for. So like I was saying, the Space Wolves got their own book, the Blood Angels and Dark Angels got a book together, which is interesting. And other than that, you basically used this book. So you've got all the second foundings, as well as a few of the first foundings. So you've got the Raven Guard, their second foundings being the Black Talons. Um, you've got the Imperial Fists, Black Templars being their successors, etc, etc, right? White Scars and all of that. Chapter organization. Ooh, look at these old commandos. I actually still have a few of these spectacular models. So, standard chapter organization. This hasn't changed. This is the Codex Astartes chapter organization that we know nowadays quite well. Um, standard situation. Same color scheme even. All this, the colors that they've given to the companies. And we got some cool squad organization showing here how you had a sergeant and a squad leader. Which is neat. Devastator squad. Look at the old heavy weapons, how they used to all be over the shoulder. But in Rogue Trader and in Second Ed, all of the races had their heavy weapons up on, on one shoulder like that. 
Hey everybody, I'm Adam. And I'm Jay. We are Encounter Wargaming. And we wanted to celebrate hitting our 1,500 subscribers with giving some stuff away. What are we giving away, Adam? Fort Bang! Yeah. All right, we're calling this the 2,500 subscriber Forge Bang giveaway because that's the target we need to hit to give this puppy away. That's right. So the first thing you need to do is share this video, the video you are watching right now. And then click subscribe on YouTube. If you haven't already. That's it for one entry. And the more you share it, hopefully, the more people we can get to hit subscribe and hit that 2,500. Woohoo! But there are other ways to win as well. Tell them about it. Well, you can follow us on Twitch. That will also get you an entry. So you subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Twitch. On top of that, support us on Patreon for five big buckaroo entries. Crazy. So also all the people that already support us on Patreon, don't worry, you're also five entries. But also, you can hit subscribe on Twitch. Subscribing on Twitch will get you another five entries into the contest. So good, and all of this to say thank you guys for all the support. We appreciate it very much. We've come a long way, and it's because of you. It's true. It's been a wild ride, and thanks for all the support, all the help. And we want to give, a, give you some cool stuff as a thank you. Awesome. So, hey, remember to share this video. And, uh, guys, I think that's it. So, we'll see you at our next encounter. Badges of honor. All the cool regalia and insignia that the Space Marines decorate themselves with. Iron Halo, marksmanship. Cool purity seals. Imperial laurels, things we're used to seeing. Specialty things like the Crux Terminatus is on every Terminator. The Machina Opus, which is on every Tech Marine. And the Prime Helix, which is on every Apothecary. And of course you've got Terminator Honors, which can be given to a Space Marine who has just maintained, who has attained, not maintained, attained, veteran status without actually being in Terminator Armor. Now there was no rules for Terminator Honors, if I remember correctly, until 3rd. You could actually make a dude, give a dude Terminator honors, and I don't even remember what it did in the game, but it actually made a difference. It was in the war gear list, which is interesting. Uh, so, here we are looking at the plastic Terminators. Awesome. The old Terminator Chaplain. I still love that model. That's such a cool helmet. I mean, yes, the newer Terminator Chaplains are a little more dynamic, but there's just something about that model that just speaks to me still to this day. Yeah, and even back then they still had these stickers, the sticker banners, um, like you can see here. So this, in this case, you would photocopy this page and cut those out and then like paint on top of it. But they also gave you, in a lot of the kits, they gave you like a, like literally a sticker. Like you had as kids, you peel off the page, you know what I mean? And you would literally like paint your model and you'd take the sticker and just like peel the little, uh, little arms over the top and it would just stick on like that. Bam. No work involved. Nowadays, they're getting into like actually plastic molded banners, which I think looks so much better. Um, but it's a lot more work too, because you gotta paint them. So, moving on. That Chaplin model as well, wicked cool. Loving it. So we're going into, again, company badges. We've been going through that for a couple of pages now. Um, Devastator badges, assault tacticals. Again, these symbols have lasted to today. It's the same insignia we use nowadays. And here they're giving you some examples of banners. So once again, if you really didn't want to do a whole lot of work, you could photocopy this page and then just cut it out. And like, like I was saying, these flaps here, they just fold over to allow it to be able to hang from said banner because this Space Marine banner carrier here literally just had this pole with the little eagle on top. This was not part of it. Nowadays you buy a standard bearer and uh, the banner is part of the mold. The old pewter land speeder, which is actually a leg up from the rogue trader land speeder. And then I believe the current plastic one that we have came out in third because I believe it was in the third edition starter set you can correct me on that I'm pretty sure it was in the third edition starter set the current plastic one we have which has evolved they've added more weapon options to it and stuff over the years this model though was all pewter 
It looks absolutely spectacular in my opinion, actually. I kind of like that it's more of a, I guess just smaller and more compact. It looks more like a fast hovercraft rather than the one nowadays. It just has the very big front on it. It looks more like a doom buggy without wheels. And the old Razorback, there he is right there. I still love that model. I would love to get my hands on a few of these turrets and put them on a new Rhino body because I just love those turrets. They're so cool. And the old Peter Dreadnought, again, no base. This thing was like a paperweight. It was like one of the heaviest models in any of the ranges at the time. It was just solid freaking metal. And it still looks spectacular, right? Like, it, it almost even looks better than some of the current plastic dreadnoughts. Nice. Again, some more badges. Showing you the banners and all the insignias. The old plastic rhino kit from all the way through from Rogue Trader. And again, the current rhino kit was actually uh, at the beginning of 3rd when they redid the Land Raider kit. Which, as I've said in past videos, was the, the Land Raider kit was the biggest Land Raider, or the biggest model kit they had at the time. Like, now we have Knights and Bane Blades and Lords of Skulls and all that kind of stuff, but the Land Raider that came out in third was the biggest plastic kit they'd ever made. And then they redid all the Rhino chassis at the same time, if I remember correctly. Which was a good idea. Oh, nice. I got a better view of the Razorback. The old Tech Marine models, I actually still use this guy as well in my, uh, 30k army. I've just given him a different backpack. And the Marnius Kelgar. So that's the pewter one, I guess. I, uh, I had forgotten that this one was even out in this era. Because they had that one before where he was just sitting on the throne from Rogue Trader, and I thought that was the one, but I guess they redid a lot of these model lines for this edition, for the release of this codex, I would imagine. And this model actually carried through with us until Fourth, probably, when they redid uh, Kelgar once again. Which model might be the current Kelgar model? I want to say. Legion of the Damned. Again, they redid the Legion of the Damned models. They came out with some of them in third, and then they redid them again in fourth, or maybe they came out with some in second after this book had come out, and then came out with more in third, something like that. The ones you're seeing here are clearly just your standard Space Marine models. You can see that the bones and the flames are painted on. They're not molded on. Uh, even the heavy bolter here, you can see that they painted the skeletal structure on there, rather than... Uh, like I say, it being molded onto the model, but later they did come out with um, Legion of the Damned models. So Legion of the Damned have always been with us, right from the beginning. Librarians, back when you actually had levels of librarians, so we got the Lexicanium, the Codicier, the Epistolary. I thought there was four levels of librarians, it's only showing three here, which is interesting, because even the Terminator one is an Epistolary. But you can see literally how their helmets get bigger. So their psychic hood, I guess, gets bigger as they increase in levels. Which is really neat to note. Like this guy has like a standard Space Marine helmet, and this guy has just a little bit of mechy stuff around there, and this guy has an even bigger thing around it. So it's your Mastery Level 1, Mastery Level 2, and Mastery Level 3. Again, I explained the psychic phase in our last video, so you can go back and check that out if you want to know how psychics worked back then. Or in the last couple videos, I guess I explained it. There's a view of a Space Marine company, which is wicked cool. Salute to the great Primarch, salute the Emperor, onwards to victory. Like, this is a massive army for this edition. Now we're getting into successors. Awesome. So we got... A lot of them we know. It's interesting to note that the Black Templars are just straight black armor. Whereas in third, they really gave, they really flushed them out more and gave them the bone-colored shoulder pads, a lot more roby type stuff. But there wasn't really a lot of roby type stuff in this edition until the Dark Angels came out. Black consoles, white panthers, cool. Yep, all the chapters we're used to seeing nowadays. 
Imperial Fists get their own page, of course. Earth's Defense Force. See, in the old Space Marine models actually look decent. The Terminators, however, not so decent. Ooh, I have to turn this this way so you guys can see this cool stuff here. Look at that battle scene. Now this is the way they used to do org buildings back then, for both fantasy and 40k. They were that sort of like uh, Middle Eastern looking mud building looking stuff. After Gorka Morka, the orcs got a massive change to their aesthetic and fluff. And then in 3rd edition, they made them more Mad Maxi and ramshackly. You know what I mean? Alright. Moving on. Alright, now we're getting into data faxes and war gear cards. So like I was saying to you when I was showing you guys the data faxes, a lot of the like card stock ones that I showed you came in the starter sets. So I'm assuming they include the Whirlwind here because I don't think the Whirlwind was in that set in those cards that I had. So you, you literally either photocopied this and cut them out or uh, eventually I will show you guys the Orc Codex that I have because that was my codex when I was a kid. I didn't keep it in mint condition. This obviously I've purchased later in life. Um, so it's still in mint condition. In fact, bending up the spine right now is the first time I've really bent it up. I've always been very careful with these things. But in this circumstance, as you can see, they lined up the back with the front, so you could literally cut these pages, and that's exactly what I did into my orc book, which I wish I never did, but, you know, when you're 11 years old, you don't think ahead to when you're 35, and this stuff's like, you know, rare as hell. So this one you would just cut out and fold over, which is kind of a shame, because you would get rid of that beautiful uh, picture there, but it is what it is. So again, photocopy, cut it out kind of thing. So now we're getting into the actual rules for the Space Marine Forces, which is awesome. So as I went through before with you guys, this was sort of the way stats increased as you had levels, and it was kind of universal for every race. Uh, so you had your base stat line, and then you would increase weapon skill and ballistic skill as you went up, sometimes toughness, so in this case, like your heroes and mighty heroes are toughness 5 on your Space Marines, which is absolutely insane. Um, and then they increased in wounds and initiative, it's in leadership, respectively. Um, but I'm pretty sure the increments of increase were the same for every race. So like you had your base stat line for your race, and then a veteran, a hero, and a mighty hero would increase accordingly. Forces of the Space Marines, taking brake tests, how to use rapid fire weapons. Now, a lot of this stuff stayed the same in from the Codex Imperialis. This is the way all the codexes were lined out back in the day. You had your bestiary, um, which explained your units and their rules, and then you would go to the back of the book for your actual army list. And they almost kept that the same, even right up till 7th. Third, like I say, they ventured off a bit. Um, no, I think they still had the bestiary section, and then they had the war... war I almost said war gear list. They did have a war gear list, but it was the first page of the army list was the word I was looking for later on in the book. Um, so that's the format we've seen right from the beginning and it still applies obviously up until 7th. 8th now they have the data slates or data sheets or data whatever you call it, data, data slates, data sheets, one or the other, um, where all of the rules are included in one little nice blurb. To avoid flipping back and forth, but this is kind of the way they were laid out here. So this is your Codex Imperialis sort of equivalent. And then in the back of the book you had your Codex Army List equivalent. You know, eventually when they came out with all the codices, it made those starter books obsolete in a way. Not really, because like I say, some of the rules stayed the same. But they've also added in units. Like we were looking through and we noticed, for example, there was no Chaos Space Marine Sorcerers in the uh, Codex Imperial Alice. There was just Chaos Maguses, which were humans, not space marines. So that just shows you how they introduced new units, and of course they've included the old units from the original release, um, just to make it easy for everybody to refer, because obviously I want to bring just my Codex and my rule book. I don't want to be bringing six books to a game. I want to bring my Codex and my rule book and be able to play, right? 
Apothecary Scouts, Terminators, standard stuff we're used to seeing. Dreadnoughts. We got two. Oh, two full pages of rules for Dreadnoughts. Nuts. Again, this is one of the biggest pewter kits you could get at the time. Um, obviously, they give you special rules for everything, explaining to you all the weapons. Because Dreadnought missile launchers are slightly different from uh, normal Space Marine missile launchers. In fact, it looks like we have here all of the weapon options. Sustained fire weapons, so that would be your assault cannons or heavy bolters. We've got heavy plasma guns, missile launchers, las twin las cannons, and multi meltas. So, I guess I was wrong. All the same weapon options still apply in this edition. And we've got the rules for the Whirlwind. There you go. So, like I say, I don't think this existed in the Codex Imperialis. I think there was, this was something they introduced with that Wicked Crayon Launcher model. I'm not even sure Whirlwinds were in Rogue Trader. They probably weren't. Again, I don't have all the books for Rogue Trader. I've shown you guys what I had. Um, maybe I can pick up some more in the future once I find them. So here we go. Now we're getting into the actual army list. And we've got the divisions of different uh, battlefield roles. So, of course... Um, you got your characters, you got squads, you got support, and you have allies. And pretty much every army was outlined this way. There wasn't HQ, elites, troops. That was introduced in third. Um, so back here, like I say, you had percentages of what you could take. You could have up to 50% characters. You had to have at least 25% squads. As you see, even says here, 25% of your army must be squads. But that included assault squads and devastator squads. Right? They weren't heavy support choices and fast attack choices and stuff like that back then. So literally, the core of your army could be veterans. Or the core of your army could be devastator squads. It sounds stupidly OP, but strangely enough, there was quite a bit of balance. I guess people just took what they took uh, to make their armies what they wanted them to be. And if I remember when I was a kid, I mean, there wasn't any, like unbeatable stuff, but at the same time there wasn't a massive competitive circuit like there is nowadays. Um, a lot of games were played in the basement or in the shop, in the games workshop. Um, maybe I just wasn't privy to it, but I don't think there was a lot of like national tournaments or everything. I mean, of course there was Games Day, the Golden Demon competition, um, so you could, you know, win national tournaments and stuff like that, but most there wasn't as big a competitive scene as there is now. And so, I think these percentage balances uh, worked out quite fine, if I remember correctly. I don't remember anybody just getting blown off the table, but then again, I was really, for the most part, only playing with like three other dudes. Dividing squads for battle, so there you go. You got a squad that consists of 10 Ultramarines Warriors, which can be referred to as a squad. The squad fights as a single unit with a sergeant. Alternatively, before the game begins, you can divide into two equal halves. Cool. So you could even combat squad back then. Because they took that out in third. You had to purchase either a five-man squad or a ten-man squad, and it was what it was. I'm not sure... I think it was 4.5 or 5th edition where they actually brought back the combat squad rule where you purchased a unit of ten and then just went... Uh, I'm going to decide to make them two units of five before the game started. I'd forgotten that even existed back in this edition, but it makes sense because they had, in a squad of ten, you had both a sergeant and a squad leader. And so that would be the leader of the second half that, that broke off, right? It was just a normal space marine, the squad sergeant, of course, having increased characteristics. So we're looking at the war gear list. This was something that was universal up until seventh. They had the war gear list at the beginning of the army list, and so you would have to purchase your weapons for dudes separately from the unit, unless they came with it, of course. Uh, cool, they even had Hellfire shells on the heavy bolters, that's neat. Melta missiles, anti-plant missiles, plasma missiles. Yeah, all that stuff's gone. They should bring back anti-plant missiles. How cool would it be to fire into a forest and have the trees just, like, disappear? Oh, you had cover, but now you don't. Awesome. Terminator weapons are, and Dreadnought weapons are actually listed differently, which is interesting to note. I guess the point values have to be changed based on who is armed with it. And of course, scout weapons, because they, believe it or not, are very different. 
They could purchase auto guns, which is neat. I mean, we expect them to have uh, shotguns and needle sniper rifles, bolt guns, chain swords. But auto guns? Hmm. I didn't think Space Marines even carried auto guns. I thought that was just the meager humans. So here we go. Characters can be up to 50% of your army. Squads have to be 25% plus, so at least 25%. And support could be up to half, again. Um, then your most armies show allies, which I think could be up to 25% of your points cost. It doesn't show that here, but I think that's kind of implied. Because they did mention that back here. Allies. Uh, allied troops such as Imperial Guard or non-Codex Space Marines, potential allies to choose your allies, refer to the Warhammer 40,000 army list for your, yeah, because this is one of the first books that came out, so they're not saying refer to the Imperial Guard Codex or refer to the, um, Grey Knights or whatever. Those things are all included in the starter set, right? The rules and such. So, there you go. Terminator Captain is different from a Space Marine Captain, it's interesting to note as well. And here we go, I was saying before how Terminators have a 3-up armor save on 2d6, rather than power armor, which is just a 3-up save on 1d6. So 3-up save on 2d6. The only way you can fail is if you roll 1s, double 1s. But remember, weapons had modifiers back in this edition. So if you had a weapon that didn't have an AP, or didn't have a mod. They actually called them modifiers in this edition. They didn't call it AP. AP, again, was a 3rd edition thing. Um, and from 3rd edition to 7th, it was either you got a save or you didn't, based on the AP. Just now in 8th, they brought back modifiers, which is great. Thank you, Games Workshop, for finally making armor penetration make sense. With the all-or-nothing thing, I just thought was stupid. <clears throat> but we went through it for 20 years, so... We got used to it, and we still do it in Horus Heresy. Company standards, chaplains, librarians, apothecaries, tech marines, these are all your characters. Veteran sergeants, even, you had to purchase your sergeants as part of your character allowance, even though they were attached to your squads. It was the same thing with orcs, you had to purchase your uh, knobs as towards your character's alliance. Same with Eldar, the Exarchs were uh, allotted towards your character allow allowance, not your squad allowance. And here's our squads. Terminator squads. So there you go. You can have a whole army of Terminators representing your first company if you want to. Veteran squads, assault squads, tactical squads, devastator squads. Even bike squadrons? Really? Well there's your white scars army. You can have a whole army of bikes if you wanted to. Jeez. Allies. There you go. Any space marine lists. Imperial Guard, Imperial Agents, Squats, and Eldar can ally, but you can't take an Avatar. That's interesting. Huh. Strange restriction. I guess the Avatar wouldn't be fighting alongside humans. He'd be like, nope, that's not happening. Screw these humans. We the Eldar, we're better. Whereas, if there was a small contingent of Eldar that was left on a planet and the Space Marines came to their rescue, you know, they might help them against the forces of the Orcs or Chaos or what have you, so I guess that kind of makes sense. So for support, we've got a Dreadnought, we've got the Tarantula, Rapier Laser Destroyer, which is awesome, because I had forgotten that those existed back then. The Whirlwind, Land Raider, and the Predator are all for support. There we go, so that's sort of, I guess, the equivalent of heavy. Oh, no, because they even incorporate land speeders, attack bikes, rhinos, and razorbacks are part of your support. Interesting transports. Hmm. Yeah, I guess it was in third that they made them dedicated transports. Back here, it was like you just took a rhino, and you could just throw any squad in it. Because a rhino is designated, is designed, sorry, not designated, designed to carry a full squad of ten space marines or five terminators. There's something they changed later in 3rd, too. Only Land Raiders could carry Terminators. But there you go. So Terminators took up the room of two. Still a situation with the Land Raider. Uh, but Rhinos cannot carry Terminators. Special characters. Chief Librarian Tigerius. Still exists today. Marnius Kelgar. Of course, the Master of the Ultramarines. Chaplain Cassius. Awesome. 
pretty sure he's still in the game. Ancient Helveticus, bearer of the battle standard of McCraig. Now, that name doesn't exist anymore, but now in 8th they actually refer to standards as ancients, do they not? At least with the Primaris, they're a Primaris chapter ancient. Hmm. That's interesting. It's amazing how we do cycles like that. Like now we're really getting back into second. Eighth is really hearkening back to this era. Which I like. I like it a lot. Captain Invictus of the Ultramarines First Company. Interesting. And the Legion of the Damned are considered special characters. I guess that makes sense. It's just so you don't take like an entire army of them, because it wouldn't make sense to take an entire army of them. You would just have one squad just sort of showing up. Because armies don't choose to have the Legion of the Damned. The Legion of the Damned just kind of go, hey, we're here. We're going to kill some shit, and then we're going to vanish into thin air, because that's what they do. Cool. They cause fear. Need. Cannot be led or joined by any characters. Cannot benefit from reroll bonuses from army commanders, standards. Yeah, that makes sense, because they're not actually part of the army. Like I say, they just kind of show up and then vanish. Oh, wow. And I guess that's it for the rules. So let's take a look at some of the old ads from back in the day. So they're showing the, the codices here. I guess I was wrong. They had already come out with the Space, uh, Space Wolves, the Eldar, and the Orcs books when this book came out, which is kind of neat. And then we've got the starter set and the Dark Millennium set, which I've shown you already. And then these old catalog pages they used to put into the end of every book. This is what their product catalog looked like, actually. And you could you could actually get it for free just by calling their uh, one AAA GW troll line, which is kind of neat. And they gave you this, they sent it in the mail the next day, and it was this massively thick catalog. And this is how the pages were, were laid out. And how much pewter there was back then is spectacular because nowadays nobody touches pewter except for Corvus Belly uh, with the Infinity. And I'm not sure why they use pewter because every other company under the sun is using resin nowadays and plastic kits are just so much more customizable as a conversion freak myself. So this is what I was explaining to you before about how like the model was just like all one piece. So that was your Space Marine Chaplain. And then you had these arm sprues, which basically came with every set. So if you bought, a, even with the plastic stuff, if you bought a plastic unit of Space Marines, all the torsos and the head was one piece, the legs were another piece, and then you had these arms. Um, which you could literally put, like I say, a bolt pistol, I guess comes on this with the shoulder pads. You could literally put the bolt pistol in either hand, and then you had like a close combat sprue as well, which had like a power axe, a power fist, um, a plasma gun, a melta gun, etc. Which could be put in the other hand, or what have you. Chain swords, power axes, etc, etc. So I guess in this case, because you only need one arm, and the shoulder pads and a backpack for them, that's what they include with the chaplains, making them like so. Librarians, same thing. I still like those old librarian models, they're so nice looking. Some of the new librarian models just don't speak to me the way these do. But I guess I'm an old hammer freak, right? Hence why I'm doing these videos. There we go, we got the old Servitor models. Awesome. Still wicked cool to this day. And again, the Tac Marines, I still love those models. I have this one in my 30k army, as I've already stated. Got our apothecaries, our veteran sergeants, the old pewter sergeants, which are just spectacular. Again, coming with the same generic plastic sprue that comes in every set. Those models are still cool, too. Hmm. Space Marine Devastators. Only two different poses, but they gave you four weapon options. Special weapons guys. I guess you could purchase, yeah. So there you go, so the entire guy is actually one big lump of pewter. No plastics involved. And then here, they've actually got a variants of the different marks of armor. So nowadays, I think you can still get the, uh, the five set of all five eras of armor. But of course, now they're fine cast because they've got rid of pewter. But here, we're actually seeing a couple different variants. Whereas in the current set that they give you, it's just like one of each. 
Okay, well we only have one Crusade, one Iron, one Mark IV, and one Mark V. That's interesting. Multiple Mark VI's, multiple Mark VII's. Um, and I thought that one with the weird rim was actually Mark VIII armor, but I guess I'm wrong. It says here it's Mark... Oh, it is Mark VIII, errant, yep. So Mark VII is your most common. Mark VIII you probably reserve for characters and special peoples. Interesting. Interesting how things have evolved, eh? Because even the Mark III um, plastics that they've come out with now look more like the Mark II helmet with the Mark III sort of armor plates. And the Mark IV looks very much as we expect, that sort of assault marine looking torso with the fish head helmet. Sweets. Space Marine Jump Pack Assault Marines, the Pewter Assault Marines. Here you go, that's the close combat sprue I was talking about. So you have the option of a Power Fist, Power Axe, Power Sword, and Chain Sword. And then we've got Plasma Pistol, Laz Pistol. Heh, <laughs> that's strange. A uh, Hand Flamer, Auto Pistol, and a Bolt Pistol. Why you would give a Space Marine a Laz Pistol? I don't even think, I thought, I don't even think that was an option back then. But again, this sprue was kind of universal. I think they even included it in Imperial Guard uh, boxes and squat boxes as well, because they use all the same weapons. Uh, just your generic arm sprue for your bolter arms. They've got the, you know, the holdy hand and then the fiery hand here. Space Marine Captains. This model I have somewhere. I know I got them somewhere. And then the, the caped backpack was just generic for everybody so they'd send it with any of these three models I'm pretty sure I still have that guy somewhere and what a cool model it is still awesome to this day that one looks a little silly John Blanche artwork just to fill a gap nice and grimdark freeze and here's the old box sets, how beautiful they looked. <laughs> Even showing you here, you got the banners, like I showed you, with all the transfer sheets. Sweet. There you go, you just your your pure tactical squad plastic box. With the, uh, the, like I say, these plastics didn't even, they didn't even have separate shoulders and arms. They were just literally, the entire marine was one piece. The bolter with the two hands was another piece. Like literally it would just be like the hands on the bolter you put into the like pegs and holes and then the backpacks. Right? So we've got the tactical box here. And then the six man box which had the separate arms. You can see the torso and the head are one piece. The legs are another piece. The arms, the shoulder pads and the weapons are all different pieces and then the backpack is another piece. Whereas with this set, this is literally a copy of what you got in the starter set. So all their arms were already attached with the shoulder pads. It was all one solid piece, like I say, except the bolter with the two hands was a separate one, and then the jump pack, or jump pack, the backpack was another one. The only one that was different was the Devastator dude and the sergeant. Everybody else was just straight bolters. So this guy obviously had the one hand holding the controls, and the other hand you just the other arm with the missile launcher you just put on and the backpack otherwise so as a three-piece model they're all pretty much three-piece models uh, even the sergeant um, I think it was just the bolter arm that was a separate piece the chainsword arm was not a separate piece and I'm just gonna go through them here with you guys the rhino and the whirlwind box beauty the predator and the razorback how they marketed things back then, how basic the boxes look. Landspeeder, Dreadnought. Again, the old pewter Landspeeder, wicked cool. Plastic Terminators. Pewter Assault Marines. Worth noting. And here's a tactical squad, which looks to me... Yep, okay, so there's the multiple part tactical squad. Interesting. And the Devastators as well. Okay, we just got a couple more pages to look through here. Here's showing you, again, catalog pages, the Pewter Landspeeder. And believe it or not, they actually give you some assembly instructions in the book, which is neat. Hmm. 
Look how simple the kits work too. Nowadays they're so complex, there's pieces all over the place, pieces that fit into other pieces, which is great. I love all of the new plastic kits Games Workshop makes, and they are definitely leading the industry in plastic kits. But these old pewter models are just so cool to me in so many ways. Like I say, it's probably a nostalgia thing, but there's the old pewter dreadnought. You can see how he goes together there. These are all the variety of pieces it came with. Like I say, this thing was a freaking paperweight. It weighed a ton. Just a big block of pewter. You plump it down on the pit table and damn. We've got an explanation of the Razorback and the Whirlwind. So again, this is just the Rhino kit. Same Rhino kit. And these are the pewter pieces it gave you to put on top. Same with the Whirlwind. Like I say, I still had this pewter uh, dude. I just excluded... In my current conversion, I excluded this one and used the plastic one, obviously, that comes with the new Rhino kit for Predators. And then I just sat this circle on top of it. And it actually is a little bit smaller, but it does sit above the rim just fine. And people love facing it. They always, People always comment on that model when I use it. There you go. The old school Predator with the rounded turret and the rounded sponsons. This is an aesthetic they brought back in Horus Heresy because I think they did that on purpose because a lot of people were using Rogue Traders era models in the Horus Heresy and then they went, hmm, well I guess people like it. And the Demos pattern rhinos too. Um, I actually have a, all my rhinos in my Iron Warriors army are the Demos pattern rhinos which have the current rhino chassis but the doors, the front have these two panels as opposed to the current rhino which has that flappy visor. And of course the rounded doors, the external smoke uh, exhaust ports, as well as the separated combi bolter where it's two separate bolters as opposed to the current, I, I, I want to say current, but it came out in third, uh, Rhino, which has a single storm bolter, square doors, um, and the rigid sloped thing with, the, like I say, the flappy visor on it. I like the Demos Rhinos. I like that they're using the current Rhino kit and bringing it back to this aesthetic. Because again, nostalgia things. But I wouldn't want to put one of these Rhinos on the field because it just looks tiny in comparison to any other tank in the 40k universe today. Final look at some cool battle scene here between the Smeldar and the Ultramarines. The old Wraith Guard models, the old Pewters. Swooping Hawks, the old Swooping Hawks still look great. I think they would blend in just fine nowadays. The old Eldrad Ulthwan, and the old Plastic Guardians. So silly looking in comparison to the current Plastic Guardians. And that's that. There you go. And that is Codex Ultramarines. So that was our look at Codex Ultramarines. I hope you guys enjoyed that blast from the past. Next time we're going to be looking at Codex Space Wolves. Now that we've looked at the generic Space Marines, we're going to look at the specialty chapters next. So I'm going to start with Space Wolves and I think I'm going to go on to the Angels of Death. And then we'll go on to some Xenos races and stuff like that. So hope you guys enjoyed that video. It was a lot of fun for me. I hope it's as much fun for you guys. I love looking at all this stuff from the past. So if you like it, please hit that subscribe button down there. Hit, a like, hit the like button as well, because that goes a long way to help us get up in the search engines as well. Uh, make sure to comment. If you guys really like what we do at Encounter Wargaming, we do also have a Patreon campaign. So if you want to help us and help yourselves while you're at it, just go to the description below and check out our Patreon campaign. We have a series of goals there that we've li uh, laid out. And any little bit of helps, guys, even a dollar... A month goes a long way, but that dollar is not just spent on going into our channel. It gets you a whole bunch more content. We've got a, a, an entire series of videos just for the patrons. We've got, um, it'll also give you 10% off the warpainter.com, so a great Canadian supplier of some of the more rare hobby supplies that are hard to find in a lot of stores. Like I say, Broken Toad, Vallejo, uh, Scale 75, he's got it all. And being a patron of ours gets you 10% off um, the warpainter.com's website, so check that out. Also, if you guys like following us on Twitch as well, please jump on Twitch. 
hit the follow, hit the subscribe, whatever you're willing to do. And uh, in fact, being a patron on our Patreon will allow you to see our Twitch videos after they've gone live. So if you don't have a chance to check them out live, you can always check them out later but only the patrons get to do that. That's just an advantage of being a patron of Encounter Wargaming, as well as many other advantages, and they're all listed on the page, so check that out, guys. Otherwise, we will see you at our next encounter. Like a monkey in a rocket on his way back home Okay. Yeah.